on TV, online, and on your smartphone. This is Chicken News. This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Yeah. Yeah, Fundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Hi, I'm Chris Judd and you're watching Talk Your Book and today we're lucky to be joined by Jenna Labib from Income Asset Management. Jenna, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Now, I thought to start things off, maybe it'd be good to just get a, a 10,000 foot view of income asset management and, and what you guys do. Perfect. Uh, income Asset Management, or IAM, we're an ASX listed investment house focused on debt. We have three core business units, capital markets, cash and funds management. I'm part of our capital markets team where we're providing access to bonds to investors, which includes private clients, financial advisors, family offices and not-for-profits. We also do debt capital market origination. At the moment, we have around 1,300 clients and about $3.1 billion assets under administration. And the RBA meetings today, which are a heap of Aussies will be sitting on the edge of their seats waiting for the, for the outcome of that re-local interest rate. It's always hard to make a prediction when this will go to air post-meeting, but uh, that's why they pay the big bucks, Jenna. <laughs> so what do you think we're going to hear from the RBA and what do you see happening with interest rates post this meeting? I'd say no need to be on the edge of your chair, you know, relax into that couch. Today we're not expecting any surprises, no change from the RBA. You know, after they left rates on pause for August, Governor Lowe came out and really, you know, emphasised that monetary policy is entering that calibration phase. So most of the heavy lifting has been done. We might need a few kind of tweaks here and there, but the hurdle for further rate hikes is going to be quite high and will be quite data driven. Uh, if we look at the data that's come out over the last few weeks, last week we had monthly CPI. It was another step down at 4.9% versus forecast at 5.2%. Uh, and the week before we had employment numbers that showed that unemployment rate ticking up. You know, one month is too soon to call it a trend, but it is showing that slowing in labour demand. Uh, notably though, today is Philip Lowe's last decision and Michelle Bullock steps in on September 18. And what themes are catching your eye in markets at the minute? Mm. Um, probably depends, you know, what kind of timeline we're looking at. Even in these markets, I'd say a week could be a long time. Certainly last week, the theme or sentiment was quite risk on with, you know, cooling signs both in the US and in Australia, giving the market hopes that, you know, rate hikes might have come to an end. Last week was month end and, you know, both bonds and equities were up over the month, bond yields falling with investors really already looking to start positioning themselves for the next stage of the cycle. Uh, you know, even in our conversations with clients, I'd say that the chat has, you know, graduated and shifted from when's the next hike to when's the first cut going to be. And if we look at market pricing, uh, the first cut is forecast for second half of next year sometime. I think on average, historically, that the gap between the last hike of the, you know, last cycle and the first cut of the next cycle has been around nine months. I'd say that feels quite quick in this kind of market where we still have, you know, inflation at 6% year on year, which is well above the RBA's target range. There's still significant price pressures, particularly on the services side. We've got a very resilient labour market. Um, only recently, you know, Michelle Bullock uh, warned of the need for restrictive policy, although this was before, you know, the, the recent softer monthly CPI data. Um, but I do think, although markets are quite optimistic that, you know, the end is nigh, I think think, you know, we still might have one hike left. And 2022 was a very challenging year for bonds. And we saw sort of the inverse correlation between bonds and equities break down at times, which, which scared a lot of, a lot of people. Um, what are you seeing for this year, read the bond market? And, and maybe a lot of people that are as familiar with bonds will see the yields going up in, in money markets around the world and, and wonder why last year was such a bad year for bonds with, with yields increasing. You're exactly right, Chris. Last year, you know, was a year where we saw that the usual defensive qualities of capital stable income assets such as bonds, you know, did not actually save the day for investors. And it was the first year, you know, since 1994 that both bonds and equities fell in tandem. But it was, you know, a unique situation, firstly evidenced by it only having happened twice over the last 50 years. But it was due to that combination of rising interest rates, but also skyrocketing inflation. 
going forward, you know, we do accept, we do expect that the long-term relationship between these two asset classes can be relied upon. And it's really exciting because, you know, we've been the ugly stepsister of an asset class for a really long time. And finally, Australian investors are turning their attention to bonds over equities. Post the you know, 2008 financial crisis, that's when investors really started holding on to that belief of Tina, that there is no alternative to equities. But now in its place, a lot of you know, catchy acronyms have popped up. I think there's Tara, there are reasonable alternatives. <laughs> I think there might be a tapas, but anyway, T words aside, the messaging is that there are other asset classes such as fixed income now delivering yield for investors. And there's a big opportunity because if we are in an environment where inflation has peaked and is you know, continuing its downward trend, but you know, from still very lofty levels, where we are approaching the end of the tightening cycle, um, then in that environment, bonds really are set to outperform. You know, the outlook for growth looking forward appears to be quite challenging. And in a low growth, but a high inflation world, people are going to be looking for ways to diversify their portfolios, uh, to safeguard their investments and a high quality credit, such as investment grade bonds is a very compelling choice. It is just a different mindset here compared to the US investors where they all talk about the 60-40 portfolio and bonds even in a you know a normal high net worth or retail investors portfolio they feel like they've got a real core part. Do you think it's our residential property here and the bias people have towards that is a reason why bonds aren't a core part of it or do you think it's just not a sophisticated market here? No that's definitely one of the main reasons you know property and shares have always historically done so well for Australian investors and also due to the tra tax treatment yeah. you know negative gearing franking credits has always led Australians to prefer those kinds of asset classes and so it's been a very recent shift for a lot of Australians. And give us, a, give us an idea of a, a recent bond deal you've done, a investment grade bond deal, so people can get their head around the, the types of deals that you guys do. Yeah, of course. Um, maybe I'll mention two if that's okay. Sure. There's a recent financial deal, CBA. They have a tier two subordinated note. It's callable in 10 years, paying a fixed coupon of 6.704%, and it's yielding around, I think, 6.3%. Now that's quite interesting because the CBA dividend yield is also around that 6.3% 6 level. So, you know, if you're an income investor, perhaps not if you're a growth investor, but it really does highlight the relative value in high grade uh, bonds at the moment versus shares. You know, if you buy that bond, that's giving you predictable, stable returns. Now it is a long dated bond and paying a fixed coupon. So that bond does have a long duration. So it will be highly sensitive to moves in interest rates. But guaranteed to be bought back at 100 cents in the dollar when it expires in 10 years time. Yes, guaranteed by the company that's issued that, the yeah. bond. And so, you know, a bond like that the other thing, as you, you mentioned, it's got the certainty of a maturity date, unlike, say, you know, with shares or with funds. Another bond that I'd maybe mention is a different sector. It's a, a fixed bond again, but by Pacific National. So, you know, when we do see the flight to quality that we've seen at the moment, then investors will often look at the infrastructure sector because, you know, criticality of these assets, uh, limited competition, high barriers to entry. So they have a 2031 maturing bond. Again, it's investment grade and it's yielding 8% to that maturity date. So, you know, as you say, they are both fixed rate bonds that will have that duration. However, we do also offer floating rate notes. One thing I'd touch on is, you know, we kind of mentioned that it is looking likely that we're going to get interest rate cuts over the next 12 months. And so there really is a window of opportunity where investors can lock in those high yields. I think often, you know, investors want to time the market exactly right. And so it might be appealing for them to sit on the sidelines and wait to see how markets play out. Um, but the, the good thing at the moment is that the extensive repricing of bonds that we talked about that's happened over the past 18 months and the higher starting yields can help insulate, you know, bond investors from further losses. And so, you know, I'm not saying that future returns are fail safe, but it is fair to say, I think that bond yields should provide a better shock absorber in portfolios than they did last year. Two very interesting options there. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll jump to a quick break and then we'll get back more talkie book after this uh, short break. On TV, online and on your smartphone, this is Ticker News. This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, 
providing a complete range of insurance, risk and financial solutions. Yeah, yeah. Fundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls have taught their own books. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. This is Talk Your Book and we're with Jenna Labib from Income Asset Management. Jenna, just picking up where we left off, uh, I wouldn't mind digging into uh, hybrid securities and the difference maybe between hybrid securities and debt. I know that hybrids are, are quite popular with a, a lot of uh, Australian investors. Yeah, of course. So with hybrid securities, you know, the clue is in the name. They have both debt and equity characteristics. So hybrids, they form part of a bank's regulatory capital. They are an equity buffer to protect depositors from losses. They sit above equity in the capital structure. Uh, in times of crisis, then payments can be halted. Um, and in extreme scenarios, they can be converted into common equity. Now, you know, earlier I mentioned the example of the CBA tier two security. Tier two capital is also forms part of a bank's regulatory capital. It sits higher in the capital stack than tier one or hybrids, and it has additional investor protections. So for example, uh, in times of stress, banks can delay repayment, but not indefinitely, uh, and the interest payments do need to be met. Um, you know, during the ad break, you and I were talking about the Credit Suisse example, which you know uh, gave a lot of prominence to A tier one securities this year in that their hybrids got wiped out to zero while their equity got converted into UBS. And so it was a very rare kind of nuanced situation where the equity holders almost ranked ahead of the hybrid holders. But their but, bonds were protected, weren't they? Whilst the hybrids got wiped out, the it, bonds actually were protected and made good. And even, you know, as you say, in Australia, they're very popular among uh, retail clients predominantly. So we had an example a couple of weeks ago where NAB issued $1.25 billion of their listed hybrids, the, the NAB Capital Note 7. They are callable in seven years um, and paying a margin of 280. Now, this is interesting because a couple of days later, Lloyd's came to the market with an Australian dollar tier two deal. This was callable in five years and paid a margin of 290. Now, you know, certainly Lloyd's is a less well-known name to Australian investors. This was their debut tier two deal here. So they would have needed to pay a bit of a juicier new issue premium in order to attract investors. But still, when you look on the face of it, this was a tier two security. So one notch higher in the capital stack, also investment grade rated. It's going to trade less volatile than the hybrids um, and shorter antenna paying a higher margin. And unfortunately, this isn't you know, a one-off. It's not even really a new phenomenon. It's really been a trend that we're seeing where Australian mum and dad retail investors are being marketed bank hybrids um, and they're paying similar or in some cases less return than the than tier two securities mm. that have a higher rating, a higher place in the capital stack. And it really shows a disconnect between the retail and institutional markets, you know, being that the listed hybrid market is a dominantly retail market. It can be quite sticky or, you know, uh, ignorant of where other spreads are trading. And so it really relates to a matter of access for Australian retail investors in you know, finding corporate bonds. And there was, a, there was an inquiry a couple of years back, probably two years ago, the Commonwealth government did a review into the Australian corporate bond market, you know, trying to look at why it's never blossomed here the way that it has overseas, as, as you touched on earlier with the US. And you know, it ultimately really concluded that Australian investors, particularly retail investors, have been done a disservice by not being able to access this market. Um, and it proposed, you know, a few recommendations on how this could be improved. But one, you know, initiative I'm really proud of and excited that IAM will be launching soon is exchange traded bonds or ETBs. And that's going to allow easier access for retail investors to the corporate bond market in smaller parcels. And, you know, we think it's going to just be game changing. So that really. almost feels like just buying a stock for a retail investor. They can just go on to a, to go through their stock, stock equities broker per se, and buy an exchange traded bond like they would a, a some stock in BHP, is that right? That's how it's going to look and feel. So yeah. it won't be, you know, all bonds. We'll start with, I think, five, you know, to give a bit of a diversification. But we think it's going to really reshape the marketplace. Great. Well, that's a pretty exciting place to, to end the conversation. Jenna Labib, thanks very much for coming on Talk Your Book. Thanks very much, Chris. Bye.